Open your Bibles and turn on your brains. It's time for the Think Theism Podcast. Can the existence of God be demonstrated? I'm convinced that there are better arguments for theism than for atheism. The meaning universe is not epistemically unlikely given theism. Any contradiction between the existence of evil and God's being uh, holy, good, and omniscient. Now, if you study a well-made banana... But that we evolved by a rather laborious combination of random mutation. One can't sensibly be both a naturalist and accept evolution. The biggest difference, of course, uh, winds up being who is Jesus and what role does he have? Welcome to another episode of Think Theism. I'm your host, Zach. I'm joined with my co-host and peace zombie hunter, Andrew. Hi there. Today we're joined by special guest, Dr. Joel Velasco. He's professor of philosophy at Texas Tech University. How are you doing today, Joel? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So you're in town for the Veritas Forum. Um, you had a debate last night with Robin Collins. What, what's your snap judgment? What's your hot take? Uh, I think it went very well. So I was told there was perhaps 550 people in the audience, so probably the largest audience I've ever spoken to. Uh, and just the looks on people's faces seemed to indicate they were very interested, they were paying attention. Uh, there were some nods, there were some you know, angry mutters, but uh, <laughs> they were very interested. There was a lot of people trying to ask questions afterwards, people coming up afterwards. Uh, they didn't want it to stop. So um, I think people had a good time. They learned a lot. It was a very thoughtful and interesting event, and I thought that uh, you know, Robin did very well in his presentation. Um, I wasn't as happy with my presentation, but other oh. people told me they liked it. <laughs> Um, which is usually the way these things go. So uh, yeah. I think it was good. And now your bread and butter isn't really in fine tuning. That's just more of an ancillary kind of interest of yours, right? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a really interesting problem. And I, mm. of course, I'd heard of the puzzle and thought about it before, uh, but I've never written about it or, or taught about it in a class or anything. So uh, really, when I was invited to do this, I sort of agreed knowing, oh, this is going to be dangerous. You know, this is a little risky. Um, and Robin Collins is perhaps the world's expert on the argument. He really knows it inside and out. So uh, I had a lot of studying to do, um, but you know, my, the training that I have done uh, in, in philosophy as well, just my own interest, made it such that I could actually easily learn about the argument. Right. So it was, uh, it was not too terrible. But yeah. there's still a lot of cosmology that I didn't really understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's same, same here. Uh, and, and, and honestly, that's one of the issues that, that Andrew and I have discussed in, in the past that Whenever we see people presenting this argument, like, ah, here's a knockdown proof for the existence of God, there's something kind of, I think, a little dishonest if you really don't understand the, the nuts and bolts of the science, you know. Um, particularly, you know, I, I think sometimes when uh, Christians get involved with apologetics, they get excited because they have these cool arguments now they can go yeah. share them with their unsafe friends. Um, but then all it takes is, well, wait, what do you mean by a cosmological constant? And yeah. Now, and nine times out of ten, yeah. neither the person presenting the argument nor the person hearing the argument <laughs> has anywhere near the background to right. understand yeah. what it, yeah. what the issue actually is. Yeah. Well, this does lead into a very interesting question about uh, the nature of you know, science and expertise in general. Mm -hmm. um, it's no, now if you're if you're an idiot and you can't understand what people read, I mean that's different. But most of most of us are smart enough yeah. such that you can have some judgment about what's. Uh, reasonable authority and what's not and what's expertise and what's not. Um, so, for example, I can read Sir Martin Rees on, you know, just six numbers and I read the chapter on the cosmological constant and I can trust yeah. that what he says is accurate and correct. Um, and it does require a little bit of knowledge already on my own part. I mean, I have to understand the words that he uses, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but the nature of science in our world today is such that uh, it's so complicated to say look, you really have to understand the nuts and bolts of the argument. Okay, maybe there's one person, maybe two, <laughs> who yeah. understand the cosmology and the theology and the probability theory and these other things. Um, and maybe Robin Collins is yeah, one such person. Yeah. Um, maybe he even, is the person. <laughs> but even then, um, he has to rely on other people's expertise and lots of different mm -hmm. things. And um, so it's really interesting when you, when you say this, it's like, oh, you know, they don't really understand. Well, uh, this is the nature of the world. When you have these complicated arguments, just think about science. Just a straightforward cosmological argument, not for God. I mean, just an argument, say, about inflation or something. Yeah. The physicists themselves don't understand all of the parts that go into this argument. They have to rely on 
the authority of others. And that's something that's kind of amazing. It's one thing that comes up in my classes, like I teach a science and society class, or if I teach general philosophy of science, there's this thought about the nature of expertise. And it, it matters in other realms. I mean, if you're a congressman, you have to understand the difference between an expertise in law versus economics versus right. philosophy. Uh, but it really matters in science. There's something about the nature of these problems such that it's basically impossible to understand everything. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it leads to this really interesting question about how to make your own judgments when what you're really making a judgment about is something like who to trust. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So uh, to go off script a little bit, just because yeah. I, I have a, a question that's interesting to me. So how, how do you think that this idea plays into the sort of contemporary, um, the death of expertise that in, in contemporary society, in, in the West at least, we are increasingly um, less comfortable actually trusting expertise and, and using that as a, as a, a more or less a, a trustworthy authority. We, we have issues like um, the, the anti-vaccine movement or, I mean, I, I think yeah. climate change is a good one. I think um, there are elements, big elements of the Young Earth Creationist movement that, are, um, that play into that same, mm -hmm. yeah. same idea where yeah. we are, we're reluctant um, to give up our personal autonomy in a sense right. to, to trust yeah, the authority right. of people that uh, that should know what they're talking about yeah it's interesting you said the death of expertise as though this is a lot different than it used to be I think there there are some aspects that have changed so for example the internet has changed the way we interact with others so one thing that's happened is you know if you were in if you didn't believe in vaccines in say 1910 you might not know that there's other people who also don't believe in vaccines. You have your own judgment, but then the three people who you meet who talk about it are your doctor and whoever else, and they may mm -hmm. say, take your vaccine, so you just have to trust them. But now, you're like, there's a million people who agree yeah. with me. And so the internet allows people to kind of connect yeah. and to find other, in, in the grand scheme of things, it turns out they're a minority, and there's a sense in which they don't realize that. <laughs> but even if they are a minority, just the sheer fact that there's other people like them can sort of... Um, validate their beliefs yeah. um, so there is that bit is a bit of a danger um, but there's something I don't think it's about the nature of expertise in general so it's not that people have stopped trusting their plumbers or have stopped trust you know if you're you know your toilet is backed up and you're like well I'll try to fix it myself okay I don't know what I'm doing I better call a plumber um, everyone recognizes there's people that just know more about plumbing than you and you just defer to them and that's how it works um, and there I think there's something uh, some beliefs are tied to values in a way that makes you reluctant to believe them. So, um, so for example, the anti-vaccine thing. So you might think, look, this is a scientific question. You've got to ask the scientists. Um, but actually, it's very deeply tied to questions about the nature of rights and parental authority. And so people who think, look, I'm the parent. I can do what I want with my own children. And I, the government is not going to tell me how to raise my children. That's really kind of a value thing. Now, if you have that view, for whatever reason, you know, there's psychological mechanisms, presumably, but for whatever reason, I think it makes you more willing to not trust authority about the scientific thing because you already know, you know, like, look, it's my right. You have a prior I commitment. A, right. I, I can, if I don't want to give my kid a vaccine, I don't have to. And so then if somebody comes in and says, no, you have to because of the science, you're like, no, I don't have to. And what you really mean is because it's my right. And so you, you but you need to reject the science. Otherwise, it just seems like you're doing something ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like if you believe the science, you would definitely give your kid a vaccine, right? So um, there's this kind of tension, but I think a lot of it, so, and it's the same kind of thing with climate change or other things. Nobody doubt, well, I shouldn't say nobody, but there's a, you know, Take another example of doubt, say, say evolution or something. The part of the reason people reject that science is because it is tied to values. And mm -hmm. I think maybe oh, we'll yeah. end up talking about this later, but other <clears throat> things that are not so tied to values, like the science that allows your planes to fly or the science that allows, um, say, some cosmology thing that's not about fine tuning, yeah. right? <laughs> They're just like, I wonder what the mass of the sun is. Um, nobody says, well, I don't have to trust scientific experts on that mm -hmm. because it doesn't matter to them. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. when the values get involved that it's sort of 
Now, they, what they say is, oh, I don't trust the experts. Experts make stuff up. But the reason they say that is because it's about a particular question that's evaluated. Yeah. It, it almost seems like there's a paradox where everyone kind of has bought into the idea that whatever value you have has to have some scientific basis. So if you agree with the value, you have to say, well, here's yeah. a scientist that agrees with me. Yeah. Without, because for some reason, right. you know, they, think, they agree, everyone yeah. can agree that saying, no, my view is unscientific yeah. is suicide, basically. Right. Yeah. And part of it is the word saying it's unscientific is, is problematic. But, um, you know, there's this idea, and, you know, I teach it in my intro philosophy classes. There's a separation between, say, the normative and the descriptive. Here's yeah. these values, and then there's the way the world works. Um, but may maybe really they're not that separate. Certainly sort of practically, yeah. they're not that separate. And uh, your values are related to the way you see the world. I mean, just think about something really basic. If people think it's related to, almost everybody accepts that their values are somehow related to whether or not there's a god. Um, but that's obviously going to be related to the way the world works in various other kinds of ways. And so it's sort of ridiculous uh, mm -hmm. to say, look, you figure out how the world works and that's a descriptive thing and you trust scientists. And then totally separate than that, you have your values and what you like and what you prefer. They're not, they're not separate. Um, and so, uh, yeah, you are in this really psychologically uncomfortable position if you say, I have these values and it seems to me that they're based on these, this scientific fact or this kind of worldview, but then if you don't believe the scientific fact and you want to keep the values, you're in this really sort of puzzle. Now, yeah. some people might change their values, but that's not the normal way to go, right? Mm -hmm. I actually don't have much of a transition. It's <laughs> such a good, it's a good uh, conclusion. I've settled all disputes. About yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, you mentioned there in passing, you know, you teach uh, intro to philosophy, things like that. Um, mm -hmm. What exactly do you do? Because I think we kind of yeah. missed that part. We, yeah. got, we got so into the science. Sure. Yeah. Because you're actually a philosopher of science. Is that your main, would that yes. be accurate? So I'm a professional philosopher. I'm in the philosophy department at uh, Texas Tech. So when you ask what I do, you might mean something like what the philosophers do, or you might mean what I do. So I'll tell you a bit about both. Yeah. Um, sort of, you know, qua professional philosopher, uh, I do research, so you know, obviously we have to sort of read a lot, but writing, that means publishing. So my area of specialization is philosophy of science, uh, in particular biology. So um, I've written about phylogenetic inference that's trying to figure out, say, who's more closely related to who and which species are more closely related to other species, uh, whether common ancestry is true. Uh, I've written about the problem of just what is a species. That's a more sort of metaphysical question about the, the boundaries of species. Um, but that links into more general questions in the philosophy of science about the nature of evidence, about how probabilities work, what they mean. Um, that's related to this picture in epistemology about how you reason and how you think and how you, what you should believe. And so that's kind of my area within philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's related. That's not the only thing that I teach, but uh, it's related to the kinds of classes I teach. So right now, this semester, I'm teaching beginning philosophy where we talk about a bunch of different areas. So political philosophy, uh, right now we're talking about free will in my class. Uh, when we get back on uh, the next week, we'll be talking about consciousness and the nature of persons and we'll end by talking about if there is our God and things like that. Uh, but then I'm also teaching a class, an upper level class on decision theory, which is more in the sense of that, like that's my specialty. That's something that I know a lot about. Whereas free will is, you know, it's beginning philosophy. I, I'm a professional philosopher. I can read this stuff, but right. I don't really think about that professionally. Yeah, for, yeah, for sure. Uh, I, you know, a, um, so Andrew and I are engineers, uh, and we encounter a lot of science, as you can imagine. And it turns out that a lot of other engineers and other physicists and people in the sciences, even if they haven't thought directly about their philosophy of science, mm -hmm. sort of intuitively have one or implicitly assume one without thinking about it. Uh, kind of a common trend that mm -hmm. we've noticed is when we talk to engineers, they tend to be anti-realists about science, mm -hmm. whereas physicists tend to be like strong realists. Mm -hmm. So uh, Ben, who is our, our uh, podcast editor, he's a physicist, and I try to tell him, you realize in engineering, everything is curve fitting. We're not, we're not describing reality. We are, we are appropriating mathematical tools to build things. Yeah. We are acknowledging yeah. that there is no... <laughs> 
like real description of reality and we yeah. just have these convenient mathematical yeah. models that we can then yeah. use to do things. Yeah. yeah. Very pragmatic. Yeah, whereas physicists yeah. are over here like, oh, we have discovered the his Higgs boson as the fundamental yeah. nature of reality. Oh, and this gravitational yeah. constant, it's in the fabric of reality. Yeah. yeah. So I guess the question here is, um, well, first, what is your personal view yeah. on this? And then secondly, and probably more importantly, how yeah. should non-philosophers mm -hmm. think about this yeah. intelligently? Well, it's interesting. I mean, when you, when you say that, I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I guess I can see it. Um, but there's a com it's completely reasonable to think it would be the opposite. I expect that if you actually did a survey of people, it would be a lot more mixed than you think. Yeah. Um, so let me. So you, you gave one story about why engineers are not realists and why physicists are. Let me give you a story why, of course, it's the other way around. <laughs> um, yeah. So when, you're ex when what you're explicitly doing is not realist. So you know you're building models. You know their approximations. You know their idealizations. Um, then you just assume there's a reality behind it, and what you're doing is not supposed to be discovering reality, right? So there's a sense in which this is closer to the ordinary person. So the you know um, an engineer who let's say they have some model of flow, you know I want to know um, how long it's going to take this coffee to cool off or something like that. Sometimes on the face of it, there's some sort of shortcut equation, which obviously is not really measuring what's happening. And you're like, look, it works. We've tested it. That's fine. I don't think that should make you be an anti-realist about science. You should assume there is a real thing going on behind it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the danger comes when you ask professional physicists who at least apparently are trying to get to the true nature of things. They're looking at the fundamental equations. And then guess what it turns out? It turns out even then still there's these idealizations and there's mm -hmm. it's really just models all the way down right and they're like yeah quantum mechanics is just this description and we can't get beyond that and it's just this weird equation what's really happening and they're like because i've studied it so carefully i know that we don't know and we can't get more <laughs> yeah. and so uh there's a whole brand of serious physicists who are kind of anti-realist right um and or philosophers of physics, and it's precisely because they work with what other people assume. You know, the engineer assumes, well, the physicists, they know what reality is like. And the <laughs> physicist is like, no, I don't, <laughs> right? And so yeah. um, insofar, now there's two different things. You, now, what do I think? Well, there's two different things you might mean, mean about realism. So yeah. one thing is about the actual nature, like whether there's actually something going on there. And there have been people in the history of the world who think... Um, you know, maybe the, the, the world is somehow constructed out of our thoughts or something like that. And I don't even really understand that view. It's crazy. Um, there's sort of, and so there's that sense of anti-realism, mm -hmm. which there have been people who defend that, and I don't really understand it. So in that sense, I'm a scientific realist. But that is the sense that I'm a scientific realist in the sense that I think everybody else should be. Yeah. Um, there's a different question, which is really a kind of, I think, epistemic question, which is about what it is that science is trying to do. What is the nature of our scientific theory. So I say something like, should we believe that electrons really do have the charge that they that we think they do and really exist? And here's this equation and it really seems to work. Okay, now this question is, why? And the realist explanation is something like, our theories are approximately true. Approximate, they're, they're like descriptions of reality. Mm -hmm. And then there's the kind of what you might call instrumentalist, which is that our theories are instruments for making predictions. Like, for sure, our engineering equations are instruments for making prediction. And the instrumentalist about science generally says it's that way even in fundamental physics. Even quantum mechanics is just an instrument for making predictions. Uh, if there's some deeper level of reality, which in some sense there must be, mm -hmm. but we don't have a grip on it, there's no reason to think our theories are actually describing that or really any reason to think they ever could. Um, that, I think, is a serious position. I don't ascribe to that position. I, myself, am a realist, even in the strong sense. Okay. Uh, I think we do have reason to believe that our theories are basically literally true in some reasonable sense of approximate true. <laughs> okay. um, yeah. But And I think future science will get even better and we'll have a better understanding of the way the world really is. Um, theories are not just merely instruments. Um, but I think there's a serious position that is worth thinking about, which is that um, there's some sort of deep epistemic block and we just never really could know, um, you know, if the deep nature of the world is strings or if there's something else below that or if there's yeah. not even strings, it's some other thing and it just happens to have the same consequence, observable consequences, obviously we couldn't know. 
And so why would you trust your theories? Yeah. Right. And, and I think part of this too that um, it, is that not all scientific truth is equally the same. You know, I, Andrew and I are thinking in terms of like modeling material behavior and yeah. you know things like that. But there are some scientific truths like uh, that human beings are genetically related to uh, yeah. apes, for example. Right. Like that, that's a different type of scientific yeah. truth that you don't really model. You don't you don't yeah. curve fit. You know, you don't curve fit to that. Yeah. Well, you could yeah. argue. So there is. So the instrumentalist picture um, usually is just applied to deep fundamental theories. Mm -hmm. But you could imagine somebody saying, "Look, um, even in biology, you know, we're making this claim that look." The evidence, you know, here's a useful model. We'll treat the Earth as if it's about four and a half billion years old, and we'll treat you know humans as if they came from it. But you know, if it was something different and it looked the same to us, we wouldn't really know. So, I think that's really weird. Like in the biological case, <laughs> yeah. um, there's obviously a fact about whether or not we're actually related. Just you know, I have parents. My parents had parents. They had parents, etc. Take this chimp. They had parents. They had parents. Either there's gonna there's a convergence and they share an ancestor, or they don't. And that's just a clear, it's a fact about the history of the world. Yeah. Um, now, I think all the evidence indicates that they do. We could be wrong, but what we'd be wrong about is a fact about the world. Yeah. Um, so it's weird to think that um, you're kind of a anti-realist in the sense that there's like no fact about common ancestry. That's sort of really weird. I think it also doesn't make sense in the fundamental physics thing to say there's no fact about the nature of a particle or something. Um, but the the epistemic worry really sort of hits at fundamental physics where you say things like, um, you know, the deep nature of the universe is just always going to be inaccessible to us for some reason, right? Yeah. So going back to the common ancestry thing, mm -hmm. um, when I was doing research for this, I found a, a debate you did with um, Paul Nelson, mm -hmm. friend of the show, friend of the show. Oh, yeah. yeah. We've yeah. interviewed Previous, him before. Yeah, yeah we have. Uh, was that we, last year? Or uh, year uh, about two years ago now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, by the way, Paul Nelson, uh, I strongly disagree with young earth creationism, uh -huh. but far and away, I have so much respect for, for him um, in... in the way that he handles the issue, I, uh, mm -hmm. I, I've been very impressed. Yeah. So when when we argue about young Earth creationism, I usually say, you know, it's Paul Nelson is the perfect model of if you're gonna if you're gonna be someone I disagree with, be yeah. Paul Nelson. Kind of <laughs> if you're gonna yeah. bite yeah. that yeah. bullet, he <laughs> bite, yeah. he, yeah, he accepts yeah. all of the the issues with it. Doesn't try to hide them. Doesn't yeah. doesn't try to. Well, you know. I mean, I I like Paul. I mean, I I've actually yeah. done two debates with him. Mm -hmm. um, so one was uh, at Johnstown, Pennsylvania. We were just invited to, and we spoke in the community college there. Yeah. And then some people had seen that debate online and thought, you know, it went really well and it was sort of friendly and not antagonistic. And so we were invited by uh, a philosophy professor and the Hill Country Institute uh, to come to St. Edwards mm -hmm. uh, in Austin or near Austin. I think it's in Austin. Yeah. Um, which is like, I guess, a Catholic college there. So we came to do basically another debate. So. So those debates were about explicitly this question about common ancestry, right. universal common yeah. ancestry. Yeah. Are we all related? Um, now there, Paul didn't want to get into a discussion about things like the age of the earth. Right. Uh, so right. it wasn't a discussion about whether there's a God or whether God designed anything or how old the earth is. It was just <laughs> about common ancestry. Um, but of course, these questions are related. And so like, sure. you know, I think, well, the only reason he thinks the evidence for common ancestry is not as strong is precisely because he's already committed to these other kinds yeah. of views. Um, but he does, you know, certainly more than other young, young Earth creationists, he does model uh, serious scientific uh, thinking and reading and yeah. studying. I think there's a sense in which it can't be that serious, otherwise he would have changed his mind. Um, but um, I'm perfectly happy to show up in a room and talk with For him sure. and, yeah. and, give it, and have a discussion with him. And actually I might not be with other some Young Earth mm. creationists. Yeah, so the, the question there, and um, you were talking about how you were defending the idea of universal common ancestry, right. and he was defending basically the idea that there's not a single tree of life. I've sometimes right. heard this uh, called there's an orchard of, of life, yeah. that life arose in multiple places on Earth right. um, and, and then you know developed yeah. into that way. Right. So uh, I guess the question here is, for people that are not biologists, yeah. um, what would be the reason for accepting a universal single yeah. origin of life yeah. as opposed to yeah. like this orchard view? Well, there's really, I mean, it's important to, I think, separate two different kinds of things. And in the end, almost certainly they're going to go together. But um, if you start to talk about the evidence for common ancestry, say you pick up a book um, mm -hmm. you know, by Jerry Coyne or, or Richard Dawkins or read on Wikipedia, a lot, a lot of the evidence, and certainly the most powerful evidence, 
is about, say, particular species, or say that the mammals are related, right? So, yeah. you know, humans are definitely related to chimps. Whales are mammals, and I mean in the sense that they're actually related to mammals. I don't mean that in the sense that we'll just call anything with uh, hair a mammal. Well, it turns out that, you know, whales have hair. Well, no, I mean they're actually related to other mammals. And so the, the kind of evidence there, you know, there's evidence like um, biogeography and fossils and homology. So let me talk about those things briefly. Um, so, you know, take fossils, for example. So I bring up whale, whales are thought to be a puzzle. They were a puzzle for Darwin. Um, of course, even by Linnaeus' time, so this is 1735, I think, is the 10th edition of mm -hmm. Linnaeus. Um, he knew that whales were mammals. So, you know, they have lungs, they have live birth, um, they have hair in the sense that some of them have eyelashes and things. So they're very different than fish, and not just in a descriptive sense. I mean, they're mammals. They have all the traits of mammals. Um, so now you get, but Linnaeus thought, you know, this is, who, who knows why, it's in the mind of God or something. Um, but then you have Darwin, who says that the explanation for these similarities, right? So take, uh, take the classic case of the tetrapod limb. So Darwin uh, talked about this with, so Richard Owen at the time, you know, professional, serious biologist, knew all about anatomy. So they knew that if you take, say, a human arm, this is the, we're tetrapods, uh, so we have, you know, a radius and an ulna, and then that's connected to... Uh, um, Got that backwards. Yes, yeah, humerus. 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 That's right. Humerus is yes. up here. Radius and ulna. Yeah. Carpals and metacarpals, phalanges. We have five, five phalanges. So this is the tetrapod limb. If you look at, uh, say, a frog limb, yeah. same thing. Humerus, radius, ulna, carpals, metacarpals. If you look at uh, a whale, fin. Now, they have got a fin. But if you strip away the skin off the fin, it's, it's more compacted, but there it is. There's the humerus, the radius, the ulna, the carpals, the metacarpals. They have got these phalanges. How many phalanges? Five phalanges. It's amazing, right? So this is the <coughs> phenomena of homology where they look structurally very, very similar, even though they don't have the same explanation, right? The whale fin is used for, you know, to help it swim and the human arm is for grasping and the bird wing you know, which has feathers, the wing, you know, there's no reason the wing should have, a, mm -hmm. but, but it does. Um, so Darwin's explanation is it's because they're related, right? The reason that you have the same bone structure as your parents is that it was inherited, but actually that's the same reason that the whale does as well. It was just inherited from this sort of original tetrapod sort of plan, and it's just been passed down. So, but if whales are mammals in that sense, there's this puzzle about the actual transition. How did they get into the water <laughs> and uh, what happened? And, you know, Darwin has this story about, well, uh, maybe a bear sort of got into the, you know, the water and started living in the water and sort of became a whale. Yeah. Um, and so there's this puzzle. And now things like fossils can help link that. Now we have fossils mm -hmm. of um, living things that lived on land that for other reasons we think are sort of maybe kind of like whales, like the ancestors to whales. It turns out that hippopotamuses are, in fact, the closest living things to uh, the cetaceans, the whole whale order. Um, and so we have fossils of those things, then we have fossils just like that, except that we think probably lived in the water, and we can tell by the types of bones they have. In the way. And then we have fossils just like that, who sort of lost their back legs, kind of like whales. And then we have fossils that look remarkably like whales, but they're sort of close to that, and then we have whales. So like, mm -hmm. we actually do now have this transition. It's still, you know, it's not as much as, say, the origin of mammals or something, but... Yeah. But we have, so the fossils can connect these things. That certainly connects other species. Uh, biogeography is the same. Um, we know that animals that look very similar tend to live in similar places. Like all the different penguins are in Antarctica. Well, not really. Actually, some are in the southern tip of South America and some are in the southern tip of Africa. Why are they there? Well, actually, those three parts used to be connected. Mm -hmm. uh, when the penguins originated, those three were literally the same place on Earth. Before the flood, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, but there's, in fact, no penguins that are native to, say, the Arctic Circle in the north. I mean, they could live there. It's cool. But why not? Well, the idea is penguins originated once in one place on the Earth, and then they just sort of spread out. Right? It's the same with the classic story about Darwin's finches or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that, those facts about biogeography indicate that different species really came from the same thing. So there's really a ton of evidence yeah. that um, 
all the different cats are related and all the different carnivores are related and all the different mammals are related and all the different birds are related and there's just overwhelming uh, and even Paul Nelson I think accepts sort of a lot of those things and if you just if you ask for evidence for common ancestry you'll find a lot of that stuff and um, the thing is is that that is direct evidence against this kind of special creation model where literally every species is created separately mm -hmm, for okay. sure now, I said all of that and I prefaced it in a way that uh, I wanted to say, actually, a lot of that evidence, say biogeography or fossils, just does not apply to the question of whether all life is related, right? So maybe you can get, just due to basic kinds of homology, say, say uh, fossilization and uh, biogeography, so maybe you can get that all the mammals are related. But are the mammals related to the birds? Well, yes, homologies, for example, can get you there and, and fossils can help you. Okay, are all the eukaryotes related? Are we related to you know, octopuses? Are we related to um, you know, starfish, things that are very distantly related? Well, uh, yes, uh, but fossil evidence will never get you there. Bio bio biogeography will never get you there. Yeah, go find me a fossil of a, right. an amoeba. <laughs> Are we related to uh, bacteria? You might think is worse. But actually, the same reason we think that all the eukaryotes are related is going to turn out to apply to bacteria. So once we have genetics, basically, is the key there. Because now the same phenomena, homology, so you know, like the tetrapod limb, there's genetic features of the way we are, right? Um, so the, the kinds of core genes involved in, say, uh, the way that we, genetic expression, so the way that we do translation, for example, um, is virtually identical across all of the different eukaryotes. Now, you might say, well, it actually it has to be that way. Actually, it doesn't have to be that way, and it's not literally identical. There's this nested pattern. There's a hierarchy, and, uh, and this is how phylogenetic reconstruction actually works. Mm -hmm. um, there's, you know, the mammals do things just a little bit differently than these other, you know, say the birds, which are a little bit different than, say, the octopuses, which are, but actually it's in this nice nested pattern, which yeah. is really only explicable through a kind of common ancestry, only if there's a sort of a single origin. Um, and that pattern extends across all living things, right? So even bacteria, you know, there's deep connections, say the origin of the genetic code. So this is one of the most famous cases. So I'll talk about this one thing. Um, and I could talk about it for the entire hour. So interrupt right. me if you want. So yeah. I'll give you one reason to think that all life we've ever discovered is related, including the bacteria and the archaea and everything. So our genetic code. I don't mean the particular sequence of letters. Like I have, so there's four nucleotide bases, you know, A, G, C, and T. Uh, all living things are made of these. Uh, they, well, they have DNA which is sort of the string in, you know, in their chromosomes. And that is like a kind of a recipe for building their body. Okay, mm -hmm. so by the code, I don't mean the actual sequence of letters. I mean there's a program that interprets how to turn in the sequence of letters into making your body into various kinds of proteins. This is uh, part of it, for example, is called translation, mm -hmm. right? So think of a computer program. So if I looked in the, the uh, you know, nuts and bolts, maybe there's some sort of assembly code, there's a language that the computer is reading and it turns it into, put this picture on the screen. Mm -hmm. And in a different computer program, a different language, it might have a different code. It might be a different sequence of things which turns into, put this on the screen, okay? Mm -hmm. So I mean code in that sense. I mean how to decode the sequence of letters and turn it into, and so it turns out that all living things have virtually identical, and I can talk about the details, but let's start with virtually identical genetic codes. So there's 64 different possible triplets. So for example, if you have three, you know, if you're reading your DNA and there's three A's in a row, um, three, three T's in a row is, I can't remember what three A's is. Three T's in a row will be, for example, phenylalanine. So it'll turn yeah. into you. So if you look at a picture of the genetic code, UUU will be phenylalanine. So what that means is, if if you're coming along and you read three U's, it'll create phenylalanine. But there's no reason, as far as we can tell, that it should create that amino acid instead of something else. The code could be anything different, mm -hmm. but in fact, it's the same. And there's a, so there's a strong reason for thinking, just the obvious explanation, is that the reason we all have the same code is that there was only one code originally, mm -hmm. And then the code just gets passed on, you know, parent to child. You have the same code as your parents because the code comes out of your, the DNA sequence itself and the structure of the ribosome. And so um, 
you have the same code as your parents and they have the same code. So that's why I have the same code as bacteria is because we're all related. If we weren't, and it was, so here's the, here's the argument. If the genetic code was contingent, so that is it doesn't have to be the way it is, and universal, that is it's all in fact the same, then it's very unlikely that multiple originations would have ended up with the same code. I mean, the, the number, the space of possible codes is astonishing, right? I mean, just the, as a rough calculation, um, so there's 64 different possible codons. Let's say there's 20 amino acids. So uh, I guess that's, is, it, is that 64 to the 20th or 20? Um, what's the math problem here? Um, one of those two numbers, I don't even want to think about it right now. I'm sorry, I really should know this, but yeah. it's a gigantic number. Yeah of possible different codes, and most of them would, would work, would do something. And so the fact that they're different and, this, and contingent, mm -hmm. sorry, it, the fact that they're not different and contingent is strong evidence that they originated only once. I see. So and there's a bunch of things like that, features of all life that doesn't have to be that way mm -hmm. and is in fact shared. So maybe as a rough analogy, uh, it turns out that all human beings have, the, and as it turns out, all human beings and all bacteria and everything in the world operates on the same operating system. And it's yeah. very, and whenever, yeah. whenever Linux and Windows and Mac are all available and everyone's running on Mac, then that's very suspicious. Is that like a rough analogy? Kind of. I mean, Linux and Mac actually have very basic similarities. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but Man, uh, true, PC, and there's, a, there's some, you know, there's, there's features of computers that sort of have to be that way. Yeah. Um, but so the idea would be something like, yeah, uh, if, yeah, everyone's running a Mac. That, that, so if everybody's operating system is working the same way, the Mac way, mm -hmm. and it looks like there's this other thing, the PC way, which was perfectly possible and would work just fine. Now you ask something like, okay, Imagine that people independently created operating systems to work with their computers and never talk to each other about how to do it. And a whole bunch of people did it independently. What are the odds they would all create the Mac system? Well, if there's only two possible things, Mac and PC, and you know, it's not that crazy. Mm -hmm. But what if there was 10 trillion different possible operating systems and no particular reason anyone is better than any other? And then you look around, and everybody's using the same one. It's clear that they're sharing information. Yeah, they got it from yeah, each other. Right? There's, there's some type of work. That's the idea. Yeah, that's not exactly parallel to the genetic code thing. I think, in fact, the genetic code argument is even stronger. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's the basic idea. Right, because it's yeah. operating on an even more fundamental level than just your surface operating system analogy. Uh, I don't want to push you yeah, yeah, too okay, far, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. that's I, I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, now, well, so I want to, to, yeah. to bring up a brief counterpoint here, mm -hmm. though. Um, this analogy, the, well, yeah. the analogy and the uh, the problem itself is it, it's presupposing that whatever is producing a chosen genetic code mm -hmm. um, is is essentially a random variable yeah, that right. you're choosing from, yeah. right? So this is a is a a good argument against kind of a, a naturalistic. Um, you know, life occurring naturalistically hmm. from multiple sources. Now, if you're arguing against the um, the creationist who says yeah. that God plop 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 created right. independently right. life, yeah, it, it's not really a probability right. argument. Now it's just well, well, yeah. what do you think God would have preferred to do? Right. So there's a couple things uh, here to say. So first of all, you know, you, you say something like it assumes that it's sort of random. Um, of course, the it's worth pointing out the genetic code is in fact not random. Um, there's lots of particular things that are good about it. It's pretty good at sort of correcting errors. But the but here's a possible explanation. Uh, there's some sort of selection thing. So maybe there's a bunch of different genetic codes, and the one that's best wins out. And the problem is, not only so it's not random. That's true, but it's also not perfect. It's not the best. So it would be really weird if different independent selection pressures settled on exactly the same suboptimal code. So that's sort of a little bit weird. And it's related to this puzzle about God. So here's, a, here's another explanation for why we all have the same genetic code. We are just created with all the same genetic code. Okay, so now 
I think you just naturally have this question, well, why did God give us the code that we did? Um, there's a sense in which, look, you just can't answer that. I mean, if it was optimal, you could sort of give that. So why did, I mean, but think about the arm case. So why do, why do birds have the same limb structure as whales as humans? You could say it's because God made them all the same way. Um, but there's this obvious question, why did God make them that way? I mean, it doesn't seem the best way. And, not all, and, and one reason we know it's not the best way is precisely because the way that humans live is different than the way that birds live is different than the way. So even if you could somehow have some weird argument that it's best for humans to have exactly five fingers, there's no reason that it's best for bats to have five, you know, their skin is stretched over the five, their wing is different than a bird wing, by the way. So that's, Fingers. They, yeah, they're, they're, stre they're fingers and they have five. And there's no reason that it should be the same. And if you came up with some reason that it's optimum for bats, fine. But surely it's not the same thing that's optimal for bats and for humans and for dolphins and for whales. So um, the natural, the best God picture is that what God actually set up is some sort of common ancestry story. Um, so there's, you know, it seems inexplicable that God would give all different living creatures the same genetic code unless it was somehow just the best for us. Then you could maybe have an argument, but it's not. So um, I kind of think that the Christian or, or any kind of theist should say, look, I don't really know why God did what they did. Um, but, you know, you don't have to believe in common ancestry, I guess. But it... All the scientific evidence sort of points that way. So if you did believe in God, you should think that God used common ancestry. I mean, that's the story that makes the most sense of the evidence, even if you do believe in God. It's, yep. It seems to me that at a certain point, the uh, the counter arguments just become very ad hoc. That You, you can always escape the conclusion yeah. as long as you contrive right. it in, in yeah. such a way that... Yeah. That you can open so let me give you a famous... You know, you bring this up because it, it sounds ridiculous. Um, so, But I think it's actually pretty parallel. So... You know, is the universe really, say, 13.7 billion years old? Well, here's one bit of evidence for it. You know, the light coming in to us looks like it's coming from that far away, <laughs> right? I mean, that is, we know the speed of light, and uh, so we know the distance to various kinds of things, so it looks like this light is very old. Okay, but here's a possible explanation. When God created the universe, say, 10,000 years ago, the light was already on its way, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's really nothing metaphysically different about that. I mean, basically, if you think there, the universe is like a sequence of temporal slices, God could have just started it in the middle, like along yeah. the way. Um, and that's true. I have no particular reason for thinking it's, <laughs> it's not that. Now, so then what you would say is that God created the universe to look like it's 13.7 billion years old. And so I think it's actually, and, and most people think, oh, that's ridiculous. You know, why? Just, either it looks like it's, and the, you know, usually the young Earth creationists typically will say it actually looks like it's young. Yeah. Um, they right. won't say, "I believe it is young and it looks like it's old." <laughs> That's pretty rare. Um, so now, here's what I think they should say about the evolution case: It looks like common ancestry. So if they actually think that God created every species separately, they should think that He created them separately to look like they're related, which is really a kind of a bizarre theological thing. The most natural theological picture is that. Common ancestry is true. And then if you also believe in God, then that's just the way he did it. Um, you could think that God created them some other way, but then you have to think that he created it in a way that makes it look like common ancestry, which in the, in the light case would be ridiculous. And I think the evidence is just as strong for common ancestry. So I think um, a good uh, a clarification here might be to help uh, how to think about what this common ancestor really is. Um, and there's a, we're talking we're getting into theology yeah. here. So so I'll give you a specific example yeah. that's coming to mind. Yeah. Um, so you made kind of a you know just a thumbnail argument. Basically, you know we have bone structures because our parents have the same bone structures. Yeah. Take that all the way back. Eventually, you get to a common ancestor. Uh, there are a lot of people, particularly Christians, that would say, well, you do that with humans. Take it all the way back, and you do converge to a common ancestor, namely Adam and Eve. Right. Um, but yet, the standard argument is actually no. There's yeah. so much genetic variation yeah. in human beings that you can't converge to a single couple. That's right. So the first question here is, why does that argument, uh, why does that line of argumentation work for uh, a common ancestor for all of life, and why is it not yeah. working for Adam and Eve? So the common, the common species, or population that gave rise to the tetrapod limb, um, 
there's a there's a sense in which you could say, look, ultimately it was due to some particular mutation, and that was in a particular individual, and the limb. But um, just the, for ease of thinking, I don't want to get into these right. deep problems about homology. But for ease of thinking, um, traits arise in a population, mm-hmm. ar- arise in a group. Um, this particular one, per- the thing you were talking about with genetic variation. So take, um, you know, the M8 multiple, the histo compatibility complex. So our immune system. Mm-hmm. Uh, has the MHC complex. There's something like 500 different variants, different genetic variants sort of across humans. Um, now, of course, mutations can lead to new variants. And so, and we understand sort of a rate of mutation. And so there's more variants now than there were, probably, than there were 10,000 years ago. Although uh, sometimes variants die out. And so it's not a guarantee that there was more in the past. Um, but we understand just from the rate of mutation and selection that there's no way that those all arose within the last, say, 6,000 years. Now, you could say, no, I think you know, selection works way faster than you think. Yeah. And in fact, the, the people who believe in the, the flood story, there's a sense in which they have to think that mutation yeah. is way faster than you think. What is it, like um, 7,000 new species every day or something like that for the past uh, 4,000 years? Probably, yeah, I'm not sure. It, it was um, the one thing Bill Nye said that I agreed with. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine, so think yeah. of it like this. It, it, so do you think all the different, say, cat species, the lions and tigers and whatever, yeah. were, were all those different species all on the ark? Well, if you just want enough room, probably what you end up yeah. saying is something like, no, they actually, there was only one type of cat or, okay. But then you have to think the evolution that is split, say, lions and tigers, has been so fast yeah. that it's happened in the last couple of years. Okay, um, so that's one thing that we know, but now maybe you could buy that. But here's a different um, story about, uh, about Adam and Eve. Also, the same genetic variants are in apes, are in chimpanzees, right? So if you think that there was only, you know, at most two variants, Adam and Eve, and then there was just this really quick mutation and select that sort of led to all the different variants in humans today, do you think the same thing about chimps? And they led to the same variants? Right? It had to be some very fortuitous <laughs> yeah, convergent the evolution. Very, yes. The very, the natural, and which, by the way, they're not in, for example, gorillas, or at least a lot. Of, so there's, there's lots and lots and lots of traits that are in all and only humans. And that's why that's we think that's why all humans are related. Mm-hmm. Then there's traits that are just in humans and chimps, but not in gorillas, for example. And there's traits that are just in humans, chimps, and gorillas. And there's traits that are just in humans, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans. There's nothing that's just in, say, gorillas and orangutans. Mm-hmm. Right? If you're a gorilla, you're actually, from their point of view, you know, more similar to humans than you are to, say, a chimp. No, sorry, it's humans and chimps are the same. Yeah. More similar to a human than you are to, say, an orangutan. Yeah. Um, so there's this kind of nesting story right. there. Um, so, and, and some of those traits have nothing to do with what would happen naturally. So, for example, when you, know, you get infected by a virus and it leaves a bit of its DNA in your body because it sort of copies it, turns out you know, people estimate this at varying rates, but perhaps 50% of your genome is just garbage left over by you know, viruses and various bits. And so you have these sort of endogenous retroviruses, these ERVs. Mm-hmm. And there's many, many, many leftover bits of viruses that every single human has in exactly the same place and exact, you know, why? Well, because we're all descended from some organism that had that exact same viral infection. And so, you know, we're all descended from that. Okay. But it turns out that humans and chimps have some ERVs in common. In common. As well, okay. And so were they, in, were they just independently infected in exactly the same place in exactly the same way? I mean, that seems absurd. Um, so the, the MHC, so the, the story about Adam and Eve, it can't go back to, if it goes back to two individuals, um, those two individuals would have to also be ancestors of all the chimps. Okay. And so, right. so you can actually use the argument. So, yeah, you, if you're looking at, it depends on the kind of trait you're looking at. If you're looking at, yeah. say, an individual mutation, that is going to trans, eventually, I mean, just metaphysically, it'll go back to an individual organism, mm-hmm. right? Um, but then that, the traits you're talking about are not just humans. I got you. So, or some of them anyway, are not just humans. So in reality, they're the same argument. But what you're saying is once you get to your supposed yeah. Adam and Eve, now you have another set of right. genetic... So there are things. Yeah. So for example, and this is, you know, my, my students are often confused about this, and many of your listeners probably will be too. I am, um, for sure. So there is this... Well, I'm, I mean, about <laughs> what I'm about to say. Yeah. So you will come across serious biologists who are apparently not Christians right, talking about, for example, mitochondrial Eve. Right. And, yeah. and they think, oh, so you believe in Adam and Eve? There's a Y chromosome <laughs> Adam and a mitochondrial Eve? No, they're very different. Um, but it is true. 
for sure that there was a single human female such that every single living person is descended from her. Now, we're pretty confident, in fact, it's certain, <laughs> that she wasn't the only human around at the time. <laughs> There's many other people around. And in fact, why chromosome map? So here's, here's where the name comes from. So each of us has mitochondrial DNA in our cells and it's in the cytoplasm. So it gets transferred uh, from the egg of your mother. So lots of your DNA, your nuclear DNA, some of it comes from your mom, some of it comes from your dad. But your mitochondrial DNA in the mitochondria comes entirely from your mom because it's in the egg. It's literally physically in the egg. And that egg, the mitochondrial DNA, came from that person's mother, 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 mother. So all the way back. And you will not transfer yours onto any kids. It's only, you know. Um, so women have mitochondrial DNA that comes from other women and it gets passed on. Men have mitochondrial DNA that comes from their mothers. So, and if you just do a little phylogeny and trace it all back, the, there is a single human female, let's call her mitochondrial Eve, such that all the mitochondrial DNA in humans today descends back to them. There's another person, Y chromosome Adam. So my Y chromosome and your, chromosome, your Y chromosome, we share, so my, mine comes from my father. It's identical except for minor mutations with my dad's, which is identical with my paternal grandfather's, which is identical with his father, with his father. That's how, for example, we're absolutely certain that Thomas Jefferson's uh, th that Sally Hemings' children are descended from Thomas Jefferson, as well, if you know this famous yeah. story about his slave. Why? Because the Y chromosome of people that we're confident are descended from Sally Hemings is exactly the same <laughs> as the Y chromosome of people descended from Thomas Jefferson's brother. So Thomas Jefferson himself didn't have any sons other than Sally Hemings. Right. But uh, his brother did, and they go down. So this is, the, this is the Jefferson Y chromosome, the Jefferson haplotype, and it's actually kind of a rare one. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly the same as the Sally Hemings children's Y chromosome, right? So that's how we know that they're related. But if you just track back, just like your, your surname, if imagine a world which is a little different than ours, it's not that different, but where every single person just absolutely automatically had the same surname as their father, okay? So I'm a Velasco and my dad is a Velasco. Okay, now if you just track back, eventually it would have to be, so it, the way we do it now, right? If, now think backwards, imagine you started Okay, with uh, everybody had a different name, then all the Velascos today would have to be descended from that one person, the original Velasco, right? Because that's just the way that it works. Well, it's the same with the Y chromosomes. They all, all the Y chromosomes come from this original Y chromosome. Adam. But if we do the relative dating, for example, he wasn't alive at the same time as mitochondrial Eve, so it's not like there was an Adam and Eve. Probably much more recent because men, on average, have the same number of kids, but their variance is much higher. Um, some men have. 100 kids, no women do. Um, so it, anyway, it yeah. works out the Y chromosome atoms a lot earlier. Um, but there were other people around at the time. Yeah, so it doesn't They go just don't have any descendants left. <laughs> uh, so we all, we all track back to, oh, actually they do have descendants because we have two parents, sorry. Uh, but um, we all track back to at least one of those parents, but they weren't the only ones alive at the time. Mm -hmm. um, it's so, worth pointing that out. So it seems like the, the standard evolutionary story does quite a bit of damage to the at least the traditional understanding of Adam and Eve. Um, yeah, right. So I, I suppose some Christians are really, they're really worried about that. I won't ask you to comment on the theology of yeah. Adam and Eve, um, but I, I was curious if there are any other areas besides Adam and Eve where you think evolution might be a threat to uh, Christianity, or at least in yeah. Well, Adam and Eve is related to a whole cluster of things. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're like, well, I don't believe in the story of original sin, so there's a sense in which you don't believe in Adam and Eve, but mm -hmm. then... Uh, what about the flood or something, right? So um, let's call it, for lack of a better term, you know, a literal reading of Genesis. Um, actually, I think for, for theological reasons that you should be really careful about what exactly you mean by that. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a whole cluster of things that go together with a young earth. So, um, you know, the idea that there was a, a worldwide flood, the idea that there was sort of an Adam and Eve, um, those stories are undermined by, say, the traditional evolutionary picture. There's other kinds of stories in the Bible. Um, let's say, you know, the Exodus story or something like that. I mean, it's making historical claims about the way the world is. That, for example, there were a whole lot of uh, Hebrews who were slaves in Egypt at the time and that they left and that there was, you know, um, that there was a person named Moses. Mm -hmm. But now think about, say, the plagues. That there was a time when frogs rained from the sky, right? Or that the rivers turned blood. So there's a whole bunch of those kinds of claims that are making claims about the way the world is. 
And so they should be subject to scientific scrutiny. And occasional claims that the Bible makes in the Old Testament, I mean, you know, some of those things are true. I mean, we think now there probably was a figure named David. I mean, we have found a king of Israel. Yeah. We have found some evidence that there was such a person, right? Was there ever such a person as Abraham? Well, it's a lot farther back, so it's a little bit higher, harder to get, but, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. Moses, I seriously doubt it. But, you know, right. um, you know th- those, are, those are sort of claims about the world. So uh, science can, in general, inform uh, whether you think certain kinds of stories sorry, about your religion are, are true. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's nothing special about Christianity, right? All, any religion that makes any claims about the world, which is actually all, all religions. I right. mean, it's sort of this idea that Stephen Jay Gould has this famous thing called Noma, the non-overlapping magisteria, where religion <laughs> is about the, the world of values and meaning, and religions don't actually make descriptive claims about the way mm-hmm. the world is. Um, that's ridiculous. Uh, right. Religious yeah. claims, they, they, they make claims about the way the world is all the time. Yeah. Paul said it best himself. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, your faith is in vain. If this historical yeah. event that I'm claiming didn't happen. Not every Christian happen. agrees with that. But it, well, but, um, I don't know. It that, should but, yeah. affect, there, you yeah. know, theological claims yeah. that you make are related to descriptive claims mm-hmm. that you make about the way the world is. And they're evidentially connected. Right. Right. Um, so the evolutionary story itself, in, in some sense, the, you know, depends on exactly how you read it, but it, maybe it undermines Adam and Eve. But related things like about the age of the earth or about the way yeah. geology works and stuff, they're going to undermine lots of other things like the flood story. Um, but it's not like they directly undermine, well, so therefore there's no God. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, your evidence, just like your evidence for, say, geology, is linked to all sorts of other things about chemistry and physics and biology. Um, your evidence, your theological evidence is actually linked to a whole bunch of things too. So, you know, sure, there are really consistent and, you know, fairly reasonable theistic pictures that accept almost everything that modern science says. Um, other pictures of theology are probably ruled out. Um, but the, these things are related. They're not separate questions about, okay, I have my theological views, then I have my scientific views, and they just like, never the twain shall meet. Um, yeah. That picture doesn't make sense to me. Mm-hmm. So it, it kind of seems like you're saying that evolution uh, or the evolutionary story may be a threat to certain versions of like a literal reading of Genesis. It clearly yeah, is. Yeah, it okay. directly contradicts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so I want to turn this uh, in another direction yeah. here uh, and talk about um, Alvin Plantinga, also a friend of the show, although we haven't interviewed him yet. But <laughs> he's, he's a friend. In so far as we've <laughs> talked about him. <laughs> about him, right. Yes. So uh, he rather, I would say kind of controversially, uh, uh, about 20 years ago or so, turned around and said, you know, the evolutionary story is not a problem if you're a theist. Uh-huh. But if you are not a theist, yeah. if you're a naturalist, you've got a very significant problem. Yeah. Um, and, and the central idea um, is that if you believe that your cognitive faculties, the way that you form beliefs about the world, if you think that that system was designed by a another system that only selected for things that helped you survive, there's no reason to think it would yeah. select for truth at all. Mm-hmm. So um, if you realize that your brain and your yeah. thinking is only geared for survival, right. then when you turn your brain to you know right. mathematics or something, all bets are off. There's right. no reason to think That's that. Right. Yeah. So uh, as I understand, you're not a theist. Um, so why do you still trust your brain? <laughs> yeah. So I think this is good. There's a whole bunch of related kind of debunking arguments. Maybe, you know, mm. for example, there's... Uh, in philosophy, a lot of people talk about debunking arguments for morality. They say, look, um, your beliefs about morality are ultimately linked to these kinds of intuitions and emotions that you have, which are ultimately linked to evolution and survival. Um, there's no particular reason they, to think they would track the moral truths about the world. Um, so you shouldn't trust your moral intuitions, but they're the only evidence you have. So you shouldn't trust your moral judgments about anything. And so really, in <laughs> fact, there's probably no morality. Or So there's all sorts of those classic kinds of debunking arguments. And what Planiga is trying to do I take it, I guess, is to give a debunking argument um, for naturalistic metaphysics or something like that, right? The idea that you can't trust this particular belief that you have, namely that naturalism is true, mm-hmm. because it's a self-undermining belief. If you believed that, you'd have to think that your cognitive faculties are probably not reliable, and so you shouldn't trust the judgment that it itself produces. Okay, so... I think this is a really interesting argument. It's sort of a philosophical thing. Uh, I was just saying to um, uh, the person that brought me here today, uh, 
if you ask, say, a professional, you know, psychologist or cognitive science about this, they'd just be like confused, and they'd be like, "What are you talking about? This is not that interesting." Um, but there's something deeply important and sort of philosophical about this, um, and so I think it's really interesting. I think in the end, it's not going to work. Um, I don't think it's like obvious why it's not going to work, but mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to work. And I want to start by just acknowledging that. A lot of the picture that Planet has, I mean, there's a lot of careful details and, you know, there's a lot of papers about this that you can read. But roughly speaking, something that the kind of thing that he said is exactly right. Actually, you can't trust your faculties in lots of different types of situations. And in fact, we have direct empirical evidence that people are really unreliable about lots of kinds of judgments. So you make a snap judgment about probability, you're wrong, right? Um, We have... (coughs) You know, psychologists do a lot of study about people that have particular cognitive biases, particular kinds of fallacies. We jump to certain kinds of conclusions. Um, People have argued that cognitive science shows that this is why we believe in God. We have this hypersensitive agent detector. And and if you just counted up the number of beliefs that you have about agents, most of them are probably wrong. Um, So there's a sense in which Planck is right. That is, if the evolutionary story is right, you got to be careful. You can't trust your judgments. Now... Does that mean I can't trust any of my judgments? No, it means you've got to be careful. <laughs> it means you've got to think about these things. You need to have more reasons. And so if you take something serious, like let's say our scientific judgments about the way the world works, um, there's a sense in which obviously we can trust them. I mean, we build airplanes and they fly. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. But why can we trust them? Not because we trust people's snap judgments about what kind of planes are going to work, but because there's a kind of selective process, right? We build something, we test it out, we think about it more, uh, then we fix it. Mm-hmm. Turns out, still doesn't work. Then we fix it again. We build. So there's this kind of cumulative learning. And science itself has these built-in error-correcting mechanisms. Okay, so for the most part, I think this explains why we can trust our scientific theories. Right. Not because we're just so good at figuring out the way the world is. We suck at figuring out the way the world is individually, on our own, just by using our brain. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, science is very good at figuring out the way the world is. It's a cumulative process of learning, of social interaction. Okay. Now, you might say, okay, even if I buy that picture, that doesn't explain why you can trust metaphysics. Yes, That doesn't explain why you can trust your judgments about naturalism. Mm -hmm. We've never, you know, here's my view about naturalism. Well, let's go check and fix it up and fix our view. No, we have never done that. (laughs) And so you might think we're just in the same situation as, you know, the caveman making a snap judgment about science in the first place. Um, but I don't think we are. I think that, so, so first of all, just the mere fact, there's a sense in which you've already defeated the argument as given. Mm-hmm. Namely, just because our faculties were built by natural selection, it does not mean of any particular belief that you should not trust it. It means that you need some reason to trust it. <laughs> mm-hmm. And in many cases, I think we do have reasons. And um, I think, for example, the case of mathematics is also really easy. It, it, it's going to link to the same kind of explanation I gave in the science case. It's a cumulative process of learning and, and checking. Okay. But what about the metaphysics case? Um, this is tougher. But I think, luckily, if you do it right, uh, if you do metaphysics the way that I would recommend, <laughs> it is tied to our scientific views. And it is tied to a process of checking. In fact, most people in the world are not naturalists. And I think most people are wrong about their metaphysical views. <laughs> so, But why should I trust my own view? Um, it's not because I'm generally reliable about metaphysics or whatever. No, you have to ask about the particular view. And in the naturalistic case, I think I have evidence that comes out of science, mm-hmm. um, which I've already gave my selection story for why science is trustworthy. Yeah. Um, and evolution in particular. Um, So if it turns out at the end of the day, contrary to what I think, um, that we have evidence for evolution and it just leads to this fact that we're unreliable about metaphysics generally, okay, I would just have to accept that because I think the evidence for evolution Mm -hmm. is actually the kind of process that's cumulative and works in this way. But actually I think that evolution is tied together and other scientific things are tied together in an argument for naturalism. And arguments in general are the kinds of things that we can check, that we can think about, you know, are our reasoning faculties just reliable in our snap judgments? No. But when we think about it and when we try to reflect and when we talk with other people and get other evidence, um, we can tend to, we can trust arguments. Mm-hmm. Um, not perfectly. Right. We're still not great at it. Um, 
But I think there's an argument for naturalism where the premises are mostly empirical stuff that relies on checkable things. Um, and then the, the reasoning of it is just our, um, our perfected ability, it's a general ability to reason, which is also selected for. Um, it's not that our beliefs in metaphysics are selected for. It's that our reasoning ability is selected for and that our scientific empirical evidence is trustworthy because of this process. Mm. Now, somebody might say the reason that empiricism gives you a good argument for naturalism is because most empirical theories and processes already have some sort of methodological naturalism baked into them. Um, yeah. So would you say that that's just confirmatory or is yeah. it more of just saying methodolo yeah. methodological naturalist assumptions work in yeah. this domain of knowledge? Yeah. So I think methodological naturalism is a tricky subject. I don't think it's like, look, science by definition works this way and you just can't ask any other questions. Um, I don't think so. Now, I'm tempted by at least two different views about methodological naturalism. Uh, one view is to just say, you know, actually there is something about method. Maybe we should be methodological naturalists in the inductive history of science sense that namely it works. It helps us lead to progress. So. Um, I'll just plug for some other books here. So this is the view of Kelly James Clark. Um, I use this book in my Intro Science and Society class. So he's a Christian, so he believes in God. And he thinks that when you do science, you sort of ignore that. Um, mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because uh, invoking God sort of makes you lazy and sloppy. If you say, look, there's this lightning, I wonder why. Whoa, God. Um, it's actually refusing to accept that as an explanation that allows you to make progress. And he thinks sort of overall, we'll make more progress uh, if we refuse to invoke God as an explanation. Um, I, now, if I were a theist, I'm not sure that I would accept that because after all, what if the true case, let's say you're investigating the, the origin of life on earth, what if it really was a miracle? Mm -hmm. um, then the metaphysical naturalistic view would say, you'll never figure that out. And you might just have to accept that yeah. um, as part of your overall package of, yeah, but I'll make progress in other realms. But why wouldn't you say, look, we've been looking for hundreds of years and surely at some point I would realize, you know, maybe it's God. Yeah. Um, so there's this other view, which is at the end, actually, methodological naturalism itself is not a good view. It's just that um, it turns out that we have evidence against God or some other kind of thing, and, and so invoking God, or maybe that the way God works is through naturalistic processes, and so there's a sense in which you never need to invoke him. Um, but it's not that metaphysical naturalism itself is like a principle of science. Mm -hmm. It's just that, as a matter of fact, the best science behaves in a way that never invokes God. But it's not because it's a principle that you have to do that. Mm. Um, so I'm sort of tempted by that. And then I can say, look, um, I don't have any principles about what science is. Science is just investigating the world, whatever it's like. And if I thought God was a good explanation, I would think about it and ask. Um, but I'm also kind of tempted by this idea that um, even if you do believe in God, that science seems to work really well without God, and it actually just gets confused mm -hmm. if you sort of bring God in. So like, for your own benefit, you should not think about it, or something like that. <laughs> I, um, I, yeah, I, I got you. Typically what, like, you know, I, I'm an engineer, so I think about this. Uh, yeah. it, I think of it similar to models as well. Anytime you start with a model of a material, you build in your assumptions, you're <coughs> explicit about it. Yeah. And saying, if you stay right. within this domain, this model will right. work really yeah. well. If you take, for example, you know, linear elastic models and yeah. then try to model something that's not linear and not elastic, it's going right. to break. Yeah. So I think it's kind of that same yeah. way of just, you know, the scientific domain in general works very well in this domain. Yeah. But you start adding agency and, you know, spooky well, ghosts. Age, so this is something that weird. came up in this debate uh, last night. So there's, yeah. um, you know, science, I mean, there's whole sciences, psychology, economics oh, yeah. or whatever. They talk about agency. They talk about preferences. So there's this really though? broad, well, there's a broad <laughs> understanding of science okay. where science is investigating the world mm -hmm. and figuring out the way the world is. And in that sense of science, there aren't any limits. Everything is on the table. Now, it might be that there's a type of explanation that is somehow, it can't be on the table because it's not actually explanatory. And so, uh, or maybe not actually testable or it doesn't actually, and so maybe supernatural things are almost by definition like that. Although, if by supernatural you just mean kind of theologically related, then no, because I can imagine testing God in all sorts of very general ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you should, you can think about linear elastic models as, look, I'm not making any claims outside this model, I'm just making this claim, and you can think about biology that way, or you can think about chemistry. But if, if you say, and it's part of the rules of science, <coughs> broadly speaking, well then, in that sense, there aren't any rules. Mm -hmm. Science is just about the world, and 
uh, are are very. I mean, there's this great book by Steven Weinberg called. Um, I don't know. Um, anyway, it's about invest. His idea about the history of the world is like what we've been learning in science is how to learn about the world. Mm -hmm. That's actually what we're making progress. So it's true. We're also along the way. It might be called explaining the world. I'm not. I'm uh, not confident. Yeah. Um, one thing we're doing is learning more about the world, that, and that's true. We, we literally know more about how the solar system works than we did before. But what really is driving the progress is that we're learning how to learn. We're learning how to do science. And so this idea that this is how science works, this is the model, and this is the restraints, no, that itself changes. We're learning how to do science, and there's, in principle, I think, no restrictions on how to do science. Science is just reasoning, mm -hmm. reasoning about the world, right? There's no restrictions on the type of evidence, the type of reasoning. Well, that is a very uh, inspirational thing right. that we can do. That's we why can science take, is so great. Yeah, we can take science Unlimited. anywhere we want. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, Dr. Velasco, we'd like to thank you again for coming to AM and also spending a, uh, some time with us in this interview. Uh, very yeah, energetic and interesting. I wish we had even more time. Yeah. Uh, so many avenues that we can go down. Yeah. So um, your website is joelvelasco.net. You've that's got right. lots of papers and interesting yeah. phylogenetic fun stuff on there. Yeah. So, I mean, that's sort of professional philosophy written yeah. for things, but uh, uh, maybe, you know, if People can go there and see if they can find something of interest of them. I, you know, that'd be great. All right, cool. Thanks so much, Andrew. Thank you for being here, as always. Think Theism is a production of Rosh Christia Texas A&M University. Our producers are Ben Hellyer, Andrew Robbins, and Zach Lawson. Rosh Christia meets every week, and we'd love to meet you, too. Please go to thinktheism.org to see our upcoming schedule as well as previous episodes.